Hey, it's John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and it's The Entrepreneurial You, the show for dedicated and passionate Caribbean entrepreneurs seeking daily inspiration, brought to you by author, speaker, and award-winning entrepreneur, Henneka Watkins-Porter. You must be prepared to ignite. As an entrepreneur, you have to be okay with failure. If you're not failing, you're likely not pushing yourself hard enough. Alex Vaughn Tobel. That's Alexa, rather, Vaughn Tobel. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Hola, mi amigos. Welcome to episode 104. Can you believe it? Yes, 104 of the Entrepreneurial You podcast. I'm Henneke Watkiss Porto. I have in store for you another great episode. I'll be speaking with Laura Vanderkam, author of several time management books, including Off the Clock, 168 Hours. She blogs at lauravandercom.com. Today, we're going to be talking about proven strategies really successful people use to manage their time. Welcome, welcome, Laura. Well, thank you for having me. All right. So I have a little fun question for you. Do you know what it what it is um, or what is meant when someone says, please don't show up on Jamaican time? <laughs> well, I know that different places have different approaches to punctuality. Um, that uh, if you're in Japan, for instance, you better not be late for anything. Uh, I was I was in Japan and uh, was with a tour bus of all things, and we actually left people somewhere because they were not on the bus at the right time, which is is not something that a tour bus normally does. Um, but if you're in Latin America and uh, you show up, uh, you know, on at at the stated time for a party, you're going to be incredibly early and and rude to your hosts in fact because they were not expecting that so uh you know there's different different places uh you kind of have to know the rules where you go but um you know that that's one of the funny things about time <laughs> right um so i've had an experience in germany where you know tour bus actually left someone and guess what it was a jamaican right. <laughs> <laughs> because they were on jamaican time which they were on jamaican time which doesn't uh, translate into germany yes. uh, uh, <laughs> which is pretty you know we well not everybody because i'm a stickler I'm like uh, was i even born here because yeah i'm a stickler <laughs> i'm a stickler for time right maybe you're secretly german <laughs> maybe i am in my other life i don't know <laughs> all right so let's move into proven strategies really successful people use to manage their time now of course this conversation laura has been um sparked by your ted talk with the same title now my question is can we really manage time or do we manage ourselves so that we you know we're more caught up so to speak well, of course, the only thing in life we can really ever manage is ourselves, um, which which is, you know, helpful to remember that we can't actually change other people either. Um, we can't change the time and we can't change other people. But we can do enough with ourselves that it can really change our experience of time um, and certainly make us feel like we have more time, that we have more time for the things that matter, um, that we don't need to spend as much time on the things that don't matter. And and so, you know, I, I understand that it's really about managing ourselves. I think the phrase time management, though, is, is the one most people look for. So I kind of use the two without really making too much of a distinction between it. Absolutely, absolutely. And so here is a little um, covers face situation. So when I was listening to your talk, right, um, you mentioned being late for your own session on time management, which is very ironic. No, take it from that angle and, and what you what you really mean when you talk about managing time and even the way we manage ourselves. Yes, well, it was quite an ironic moment for all involved when I walked in late to my own speech on time management. But, uh, you know, and, and this is the funny thing about doing this for a living is people do expect me to be on time everywhere. And unfortunately, I'm not. Um, I do try. Uh, but uh, life, life intervenes on time at times. I think broadly, uh, managing time well, though, means that you're spending as much of your time as possible on the things that are meaningful and enjoyable to you and the people you care about, and that you are trying as much as possible to spend limited time 
on things that are not meaningful or enjoyable to yourself and the people you care about, things that aren't really advancing you toward the life you want. And so, you know, one could certainly make an argument that if you wind up you know, late to something that really wasn't that important, I don't know, a meeting on office fridge policies or something, because you were interacting with your your most important client, you were having a really good conversation, I would say that you were still managing time well. I mean, yes, you were late to something, but you were late to something that really didn't matter and wasn't probably the best use of anyone's time anyway, um, and that you were spending your time on on the things that were most important for you professionally. So, you know, it, it's it's about taking a holistic view of time and, and always making sure that you're spending it in ways that align with your values. Absolutely. And it brings to memory a TED talk that I want. Um, you can by now realize that I'm a big fan of TED talks, right? Of course. Yeah, we're good, <laughs> good things to listen to. Yeah. Bucket list. Yeah. Hashtag bucket list item for me. Um, so, right. I was watching a TED talk and I subsequently had um, that presenter on as well as a guest. And what she was talking about is something that resonated, resonated well with me in terms of we don't have, um, you know, people talk about work life balance and stuff like that. I don't think that's what we have. I believe what we have is, is work life or whatever else harmony so that everything works in tandem with each other. And you're spending time on the things, as you mentioned earlier, that are important to you and not necessarily, um, you know, from the viewpoint of everybody else. So at that given time, what is most important to you and where should you be allocating your time so that you get the most of that? Because you may be talking to that client as you, you know, as you mentioned or give an example too, that you may not get another opportunity to have such an intense or, you know, meaningful conversation in, as part of the relationship building process. So it's actually very critical. And so it's all boils on to what is important to you. Definitely agree with that. Yeah. And you mentioned the, the work-life balance phrase. And, and this is one of these things where I think metaphors can get us into trouble. Um, because I know lots of people use that phrase work-life balance. And, and I do too, because again, it's what people search for. Same thing of time management. Like nobody goes out there searching for work-life harmony, much as I wish they would. Uh, that, that, that tends not to be the term that, that people use. Um, but because balance implies two sides of a scale, right? And so for the, for one to go up, the other has to go down. Exactly. And, so you'll never and, have balance. <laughs> and these pit, these pit the two against each other. And so it becomes this code word for working less, right? Nobody says, oh, I have a work-life balance problem, meaning like I have way too much life and I need more work. Um, <laughs> I would argue that for some people that actually is the case. Uh, and, and that's, you know, something we don't necessarily consider all that much, but it, but it does happen. Um, but, you know, in many cases, that's not true. I find that uh, really being engaged and excited about work and feeling stimulated and challenged by it can actually give you a lot of energy for the rest of life, too. Um, and when you're feeling whole in the rest of life, if you're feeling char well charged because you are taking care of yourself, getting enough sleep, exercising, spending time with the people you love, well, you also have more energy for work as well. Uh, and, and so it's really not a trade-off, as, as people usually think. It's not an hour-by-hour hour sort of thing. The, you know, people, one of the particular things that uh, always bugs me about the phrase is that um, work-life balance also then implies that if you spend more time at work, inevitably your family loses the time. And yet people spend time on things other than, say, work and their children and spouses. Um, you know, people watch TV, for instance. It's possible that you could spend another hour at work and spend another hour with your family and watch two less hours of TV and you'd still come out, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's, there's things you can do less of. So, yeah, that's that's another way to think about it. Right. And it's always, you know, it's, you know, there's an opportunity cost for everything. So when you give something up, then it means that, you know, um, you're spending more time somewhere else. And when you spend more time on a particular era, then you therefore have less time to spend on. So, so it's all about perspective and context. And now that we have framed it and we have put it into context, then we understand exactly what we're talking about when we talk about time management. Um, I want us to talk about what really is effective time management. I mean, we would have alluded to it in our conversation prior, but um, just to get a little more specific, what is effective time management? Uh, effective time management is having a 
intention for your time. Uh, I was about to use the word plan, but I know a lot of people don't like the word plan. Um, so let's, <laughs> let's use the word intention yeah. um, and being intentional about where your time goes and consciously spending more time on, on the high value activities and, and consciously spending less time on the activities that are not adding value to your life. And, you know, you can't get rid of them 100%. I think people talk themselves into some problems when they're like, oh, I'm going to try and get rid of all this stuff. Well, and then, you know, your pants never wind up at the dry cleaner. Um, <laughs> so you, you got to work with that. But uh, trying to spend as much time as possible on the things that are meaningful and enjoyable. Absolutely. Uh, so it's about setting intentions, right? Um, and even as we are still fresh into the new year, they're making resolutions and they're having all these grandiose plans and stuff. It's really is about setting intentions. Like I really don't set resolutions. Like I realized that once I set a resolution, like way back when I went, when I was much younger, I thought it was the in thing to do. So I would, oh, I'm going to make some resolutions. So by the second day of January, they go out the window, right? So you really are correct, um, you know, in terms of talking about intentions and setting what your intentions are. And so as a man think it in his heart, so is he. And the things that we focus on, they get magnified. So when we set intent, then um, we can see the benefit of that. Um, so would you consider... Because this program is for entrepreneurs and, of course, leaders. Would you consider effective time management like a foundation for success in life and in business? Well, definitely, because how we spend our hours is how we spend our lives. And whatever we're going to do in our lives is a function of how we spend our hours. So building a business is about spending your hours in ways that contribute to the growth of that business and, and hopefully, you know, solve some problem in the world that you are uniquely positioned to solve. Um, you know, having relationships with people is about investing time. Time uh, in growing the relationships with those people or having a better relationship with ourselves is also about investing the time in making ourselves all the people we can be. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that having good intentions with our time and spending our time in important ways uh, is, is how we will accomplish the things that we want to do in life. And so that's why we need, need to keep asking the question of how we are spending our time. Well, first, we need to figure out where our time is really going, um, because a lot of people don't actually know. Uh, we tell ourselves various stories about where the time goes, but we, we don't truly know where our hours go. But once we get that, um, once we have the data on where our time really goes, evaluating it and asking it, well, is this way of how I'm spending my hours moving me toward the life I want? And if so, great. Uh, and if not, what can I do about it? And if it's more of a mixed picture, which is probably the case for most people, what can I scale up and what can I scale down? So is this way of spending my time, you know, spending my hours giving me more of what I want? It's always good to have ourselves answer these questions you know be very you know we can fool other people or try to fool other people but we really can't fool ourselves i mean if we get that bad then something is seriously wrong right now <laughs> we have seen where there are some clear i mean fairly successful people you know people that we would by our standards of success, in maybe in terms of material things or um, in terms of lifestyle on a whole, are seemingly successful, but somehow they can't seem to get a handle on this time thing. What, what, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, different people have different ways of approaching life. And it's, it's really hard to judge from the outside. I mean, in general, if, if something works for someone, then it works. Like we all have to make our own decisions about what we value in life. And maybe some people have made a decision that putting pretty much all their time and effort into a business venture is what they want to do. And they don't necessarily care about putting as much time into their relationships as other people might. And that is a choice they are making. Um, and if they've managed to get people in their lives who are okay with that, um, then I guess more power to them. Um, but uh, I, I actually don't think it needs to be the harsh trade-off that people often think it is. Uh, I think this, if when it is a trade-off, that is a trade-off that people have chosen to make a trade-off. Um, there was a study in Harvard Business Review a couple of months ago that looked at how CEOs spend their time. They had a, a fairly large number of uh, publicly traded company CEOs 
track their time for a couple of weeks. And actually they had their assistants track their time. So they weren't really having the person do it themselves, but they tracked all their times. So they tracked their personal and their work time. And on average, these people were working around 60 hours a week. Um, and you know, 60 hours is a long work week, but it is not the full 168 hours that are in a week either. Uh, these people were sleeping about seven hours a day. So if you say about 49 hours a week, so if you are working 60 and you are sleeping, uh, let's say 48, I think was the actual number of the week. Well, that gets us to 108 and there are 168 hours in a week, which meant that these people had 60 waking non-working hours to use. Um, so, you know, some people probably chose to do various things with that time. I don't know, watch movies on planes. I, I'm not sure what they do with that time. But but a number of people did invest a reasonable amount of time in their family relationships or with a few close friends. Um, definitely people were exercising, partly because it's a great way to make sure that you keep your energy up for those, you know, 60 working hours per week. But, you know, it's it's hard to say that you couldn't find time in, in 60 waking, non-working hours or, or even 50 or 40. Let's say it was 42. Well, that would be the equivalent of six hours a day that you have for waking, non-working stuff. Um, you know, particularly if you are a, a big, important person, as these people were, you're probably not spending a whole lot of that time on chores. You probably have other people who are doing things like mowing your lawn. Uh, so, you know, there is time for high quality personal pursuits if you want. If you don't wish to make time for those things, that's fine. Um, but you certainly can. And we want to talk, because you've alluded to it, your book, Off the Clock, 168 Hours. So I presume some of what you just share is also in that book. I need to get a little more from you, you know, why you wrote that book and what is it really about? 168 hours is the number of hours in a week, like we were just talking about. And that's a basic approach, you know, my, my philosophy of time management. Off the Clock is a book that came out more recently. And it's more about how we feel about our time, how we think about our time. Um, because I've long wondered how some seemingly busy people, you know, they have a lot going on professionally, personally, whatever. And yet they, they act like they have all the time in the world. They act very relaxed about their time. Like if you're talking to them, you don't get the sense that they're always trying to race off to something else. So, you know, they're not pulling out their phone and looking at it. You know, they are focused on you. They're calm. They're relaxed. And I say, well, what are these people doing? Like, why do they feel this way about time when other busy people are, you know, running around like chickens with their heads cut off? And, <laughs> and so what I did is I had 900 people with full-time jobs and families track their time for a day. And then I asked them questions about how they felt about their time. And so I could compare schedules, you know, of the people who felt the most relaxed about time with people who felt more starved for time. And, you know, what, what are they doing differently? And so Off the Clock uh, came out of that study. All right. So we talked about Off the Clock and we talked about 168 hours. Now, as we are, we have a few minutes remaining on our conversation. So we want to move um, specifically into some strategies that work in terms of time management for success. So we can you can take us through those in the final few minutes that we have left. Sure. Well, my first suggestion is is probably the most difficult, but I would highly recommend people give it a try, which is to try tracking your time for a week. Um, and now if you have a dedicated assistant, that person could probably track how you spent your work time. And then you just need to track how you spent your personal time. But you can do it for your work hours as well. But try tracking your time for a week on, you know, any any sort of tool that'll work. I track my time on these weekly spreadsheets, but you can use a time tracking app. You can just write down in a notebook, but you want to get a really good sense of where the time really goes. People tell themselves all sorts of stories about where the time goes um, that may or may not actually be true. And we want to know. We want to make sure we have good data because like any business decision, you, you, you need data to make wise choices. Same thing with your time. Um, so that would be my first suggestion. Uh, my second suggestion is to try thinking through your weeks before you're actually in them. And so that's a fancy way of saying plan your weeks. But I, I kind of like this formulation because it gets more at this idea of intention. So every Friday afternoon, I make myself a uh, three category list for the next week, professional to so career relationships and self. And I think, well, what are my top priorities in each of these categories uh, for the next week? And I list those out and then I look on my calendar and I see roughly where they can go. And by doing this, 
I make sure that I am making progress on the various goals that I've established for myself. And it also is a good way um, to, if the week falls completely apart, I mean, people sometimes ask me, well, what do you do if the week then completely falls apart and there's all these emergencies you have to deal with? Well, first, it is not a surprise that emergencies happen. Uh, you don't know what they are going to be necessarily, but stuff comes up. I mean, that's life. Anyone can plan a perfect schedule. That's, that's not the point. What this list more does is it's a short list. And so I know if the week falls apart, what are the three things I still need to do? Like everything else can go away, but these three things need to happen. Uh, and, and by being sort of focused on that, I, I find that I'm a lot more relaxed about time because um, I know that, you know, I may not be doing some things, but I am doing the things that I have decided really matter. And, and that goes a long way toward making us feel like we're making the most of our time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, is, is there a final um strategy you want to share or you want to close off with your final thoughts? Yeah. So uh, I've actually been repeating a certain a phrase to myself a lot, which is actually a phrase that's out of um, my next book, which is called Juliet School of Possibilities out in March, um, which is a time management fable. It is about a young consultant whose life is falling apart on various dimensions until she meets a mentor figure named Juliet who, who shows her the difference between, you know, sort of pointless busyness and a well-chosen life. Anyway, Juliet um, repeats this phrase to her when, you know, Riley, who's the main character, is trying to decide what she should be spending her time on because there's so many demands on her time. I mean, she could be busy absolutely every minute of the day, but, the, you know, it's unclear if she's actually getting what matters done. And Juliet uses this phrase. She says, expectations are infinite. Time is finite. You are, you are always choosing. Choose well. And so I love that sort of choose well phrase because people forget sometimes that time is a choice. But the truth is, there's so many demands that you actually cannot ever meet all of them, right? But when you add up the ones from work, family, self, community, everything, you could never meet all those demands. The choice to meet one is always a choice not to meet the other in, in some level. So you're always choosing which demands, which expectations you are going to respond to, including your own, right? And, and so we want to make sure that we are choosing wisely. Um, it's not just what's in front of you. It's you are making a choice. And so since you are making a choice, make sure you choose well. Um, so I write that phrase, choose well, all over the place and uh, try to pay attention to it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, there's an opportunity cost there. Expectations are infinite. Time is finite. Choose well. Well said, Laurel. I have been having this amazing conversation, my peak performance, as you know, with Laura Vanderkam. Laura, I'm going to ask you, you know, I thank you so much for joining me and just want to ask you to share your contact information because I know our community wants to get in touch with you. So go right ahead and share that. Yeah, well, please come visit me at my website, lauravandercam.com. Um, there's ways you can connect with me there, fill out forms or email me through that. Um, or, you know, on, I have an, a podcast called Best of Both Worlds. Uh, and I'm also on social media, various places, usually as at L Vandercam. Uh, so looking forward to connecting with people there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, thank you for having me. Yes. And thank you, my peak performers, for tuning in to this episode with Laura Vanderkam. I am looking forward to connecting with you next week. In the meantime, I have some info that can change your life for the best. Now, LeaderCast, the largest one-day leadership event in the world, is happening at the Nutswood Court Hotel in Kingston, on May 10, via live stream, LeaderCast Kingston will bring experts such as Gail King and Andy Stanley to help you master the art and science of developing and leading healthy teams. Of course, the theme for LeaderCast this year is leading healthy teams teams get your tickets now for 20 percent off when you visit hennikawatkisporter.com book your spot you don't want to miss this opportunity it's the second time that i'm hosting leadercast kingston it's my third leadercast event having done leadercast kingston last year and leadercast women in october following the May's event so this may again join us at the nutsford 
Court Hotel. Remember, you were born to win, but to be a winner, you must plan to win. Prepare to win and expect to win. What good?